there was not a better way to introduce our current sermon series that we are in than with the challenge that we just had to go, run, seek, find, never stop. Are y'all energized to keep up the good work that God started here at West Florida Baptist Church? Some of you are. Some of you are matching the cloudy weather that we have outside this morning, all right? So, oh man, this is going to be an energetic type of a message. I, can I tell you this morning, you know what will make you never want to stop? Weeks like last Sunday will make you never want to stop. Wasn't last Sunday absolutely an amazing day for those of you? Will you praise the Lord for what God did last week in our church? I have to tell you today, I loved every single thing about that Sunday. Uh, as we were leaving the beach last Sunday night, as we were getting ready to pull away, my wife even made the comment. She's like, I think out of all the days that I've experienced at West Florida Baptist Church, and there's been a whole lot of days in her 30 some plus years, I'll be really nice. <laughs> She's been here a very long time, and she loves West Florida Baptist Church, but even she made the comment, I think out of all the days that we've had here, that, that's got to be right at the top as probably my favorite day out of them all. It was an absolutely incredible way. We got a lot to praise the Lord about. Hey, I got to say this. The weather was phenomenal. Some of you might think, man, some of you I heard complaining, like, why did you give us black shirts in the hot Florida sun? I got As far as Florida in July goes, you're not going to get a better day than that. There was a nice breeze blowing at the beach. There was no rain like what we're dealing with this weekend. The food, what can I even say about the food? There was a lot of it. I mean, did you all see that food that we had last week? There was an entire pavilion filled with food. It wouldn't surprise me if someone came and visited our church just because they saw all that food and they're like, I want to be where those people are at, man. That was amazing. Uh, my heart was just full just seeing people fellowshipping and talking. I love when people come up and say, I don't even know who so many of these people are. And I think that that's fantastic. And what I have to say, if you don't know someone, go get to know someone. There's lots of people to meet. God's blessing our church. It's growing. The singing was incredible. But what topped it all off, what topped the entire day off was the testimonies and the baptisms, and the life change, and the transformation, and the answered prayers, and the work that God is doing in people's hearts and lives. That's what made that day so special. And I got to tell you, that I wish y'all could have been out there with me in the water doing that baptism. I'd never done a beach baptism before. That was the first time. And then like, it was just so cool. I saw a lot of the videos from behind, but like that march down that entire, um, that walkway out to the beach, and it was just lined with people. And I'm down there, and I'm just like, how long is this line going to go? I mean, people just kept coming and coming. And then when we were in the water and when we were doing the baptisms, it was like, it was almost surreal. It was like a little amphitheater. I mean, it just, the, the wall of people that was just out there lying in the beach and just, I don't know this, the way the sun was going down. And then just to think about what God's doing in people's lives. I mean, it really was a special day. It was incredible. And you know what I say from all of that to West Florida Baptist Church? Go, run, seek, find, never stop. Never stop desiring more people that will believe in Jesus and his transforming power. Has he transformed your life? Has he been good to you? He's been good to me. Let's never stop. Let's pursue more people. Hey, let's never stop wanting more people to belong to his church and what God's doing. Hey, let's never stop wanting more people to become and let's never stop becoming the people that God created us to be and what he wants to do in us and through us. Never stop. That leads me to the title of our message this morning and where we're going in our passage this morning. Never stop, but finish well. Never stop, but finish well. This passage made me think of this mug. I got this mug a couple of years ago as a gift, and I think about this all the time. It's, it's got a quote on there from a very wise person, and the quote, you can't read the quote, but the quote says this. It says, don't worry, things will slow down after this. And the very wise person that made that quote was a man by the name of Mike Brown. That's me. Very, very wise person. I got this from Pastor Ben several years ago, um, and it kind of became a joke because, quite frankly, this ministry never stops. But I'm a very optimistic person, and when we're in the middle of a busy season, I don't do this anymore because I've learned my lesson from it, but when we were in the middle of a busy season, whether we're preparing for Love My Neighbor Day or an anniversary weekend or Christmas or Easter or whatever it is that's going on, I would always make the comment, hey guys, don't worry. I know you're tired and I know we're working hard, but don't worry. Things will slow down after this. 
And I genuinely believed it, but guess what? Things have not slowed down. And as the years have gone on, I, I've, I've actually become very okay with that. I'm glad that things aren't slowing down because God is blessing. God keeps sending more people our way. God keeps giving us more opportunities. And it's a privilege to be able to be a part of what God is doing. And guess what? Things will slow down when we get to heaven one day, and that's going to be okay. So I brought that mug because this passage... And Paul just makes me think of that idea. In the verses that we just read, and as we break through, as we go through this this morning, you're gonna see that Paul never stops. Man, he's got that, like, that fighting spirit, man. Paul's always hungry for more. He's going, he's running hard, he's always looking ahead to what's next, man. He's dreaming big, but you know what he's also doing? He's also finishing the things that he started. To me, these last two chapters, the last half of chapter 15 and all of chapter 16, when I think about Paul just talking about his practical everyday ministry, I just think of it as a manual for healthy ministry. And the key that really stood out for me in this passage today that, that really jumped out at me, the key to never stopping, the key to not burning out in our, in our walk with Christ where we have that fire and we have that passion to continue to do more, one of the big keys to that is to finish well. To finish the things that we start. You see, here's a, here's a big thing I want us to understand. When you know why you are here, and when you know where you are going, okay? If, do you know why you're here? And do you know where you're going? Paul did. Paul knew why he was on this earth. He knew what God had called him to do. He knew where he was going. And as a result of that, you know what? He was dreaming big, but he also had clear direction, and as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that he fully understood where God had him and what God wanted him to do, he was able to run his race. He was able to run it to its fullest. He was able to have that never stop mentality, but he was finishing things all along the way. And there was victory after victory, and there was an excitement and an intensity in him. And the same thing can be true of us if we learn some of these lessons as we go along the way. So never stop, but finish well. And as you do this, man, you will be rejuvenated and God will bless because you'll see his hand moving and working everywhere. So let's dive right in, all right? So if we're going to finish well, it has to begin with something. You can't finish unless you begin. So begin with holy ambition. Begin with holy ambition. Everybody look at verses 22 and 23 with me in chapter 15. Here's what it says in verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire, everybody help me with that last line, okay? Ready? What's it say? And having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Right here in these verses, we find out that Paul had been dreaming for many years about getting to Rome. Paul desperately was desiring to get to Rome, but he was not able to get there because he was hindered by holy ambition. Now, we covered this two weeks ago when we were in the beginning of chapter 15. You know what Paul's holy ambition was? Paul's holy ambition was to preach the gospel where Christ had never been named. That's a pretty big holy ambition right there. That, Paul was a minister of God to the Gentiles, and his holy ambition was to preach Jesus in places where he had never been named. And Paul had been doing this. He had fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum, and God had blessed in tremendous ways. Paul was literally part of turning the world upside down for Christ. But you know what's awesome about Paul? He says he's finished where he was at. His ministry from Jerusalem to Illyricum was done, but he's not done. He's not about to go into retirement. He's still hungry for more, okay? So Paul had holy ambition. Paul was driven. Everybody look at verse 24 with me. Look where we go next. So, man, he's, he's, he's ready for what's next. In verse 24, it says this. Whensoever I take my journey into where? I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Now, Paul's talking about going to Rome. Again, he's been desiring for years to get to Rome. And you know what he's looking forward to when he gets to Rome? He's looking forward to being filled with their company. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for some awesome fellowship with the church at Rome. Now, you know what's incredible? These people had never met Paul, and Paul had never met these people. 
But have you ever been around a group of Christians that you don't know anything about, but there's just instantly a connection that's there, and there's just some sweet fellowship that you enjoy? Hey, if you've never been on a missions trip, go on a missions trip. Show up at a church in another country where you can't even speak the same language with those people and find out the camaraderie and the sweet spirit that you all have because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's, he's looking forward to getting to Rome and being filled with their presence and being filled with their company. He knows it's going to be sweet. But guess what? His ambition in life was not to get to an awesome church. His ambition in life was not just to, to kick back and go into retirement and just pastor the church at Rome and everything be okay. No, his ambition was to minister to them so that they would in turn minister to him, so that they would support him. You know what the book of Romans is? The book of Romans is probably one of the longest and most theological missionary support letters that's ever been written. The whole purpose of what Paul was getting to was here at the end. And he had taken his time to teach them and to bring them along. And then he says his goal behind why he's writing this book. I'm writing this book because I want to come to you. But ultimately, I want to go to Spain. And I need your help getting to Spain. And I need you to give to my ministry and support my ministry so that we can go to Spain together and we can reach Spain with the gospel of Christ. Now, follow me. Okay, everybody with me? So Paul had holy ambition. Paul was driven. Paul was dreaming big. Paul wanted to go to Spain. You know what he's doing? He's dreaming about pushing the boundaries of the gospel. Paul's dreaming about fulfilling Old Testament prophecies where it said that one day the gospel would go and be preached to the ends of the earth and Jesus would draw all people to himself from every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation. And Paul wasn't satisfied because there were still more people that needed to be reached. And Spain, Spain to him was, was considered the ends of the earth. It was reaching out further and greater and deeper than the gospel had ever reached before. You know what's amazing about Spain? It felt like, back then, like the ends of the earth. Many historians believe there was not much of a Jewish presence at all, which means there would not have been much of a knowledge about God. And it was completely filled with Gentiles. And it was also a land, according to his, historians, that was filled with barbarians. How many of you want to go reach barbarians? I mean, that doesn't sound like the most uh, attractive ministry calling in the world. Just that word right there. I mean, I think that just says it all. Barbarians. And I know barbarians were considered by the Romans back then just people that were uncivilized. They didn't get to enjoy the, um, the luxuries of the Roman life and being Roman citizens. But you understand what Paul was wanting to do? He was wanting to take the gospel to unreached people groups to people who had never heard about Jesus, to people who knew nothing about God, to people who had the same longings in their heart and soul. Why am I here and where I'm going? Paul wanted to take them the answers. He wanted to take them Jesus. And as fruitful as his ministry has been, he was not satisfied. There's no stopping in Paul. He wanted more. He wanted more souls. He wanted more churches. He wanted more transformation. He wanted to experience more of the power of God. Paul was dreaming big. And you know what I said to our church this morning? Here's the practical application from all of this. Anybody want to guess what it is? It's not too hard. Dream big. Dream big. God wants us to dream big. I, I feel everything about this passage and Paul's desires and Paul's dissatisfaction for more. I feel this in the depths of my soul. Last week when we got done with the beach baptisms, I mean, pretty much we were almost the last people to leave and everything was just about cleaned up and I would just, again, my heart was full. It was an awesome day. And I was talking to Aaron Maynard, actually, and, and he just came up, and he's like, man, this, this day was incredible. And he said, he said, preacher, how are we going to top this? And I love that question. I love it for, it for many reasons, because already, right there on the spot, was this holy dissatisfaction that's just starting to creep in. Like, once you taste something that's so good and amazing, what do you want? You want more. You're not satisfied. And I also understand that feeling too because whenever we get done with a big day or God does a work like that, I'm just like, how, how is he gonna do something that big and something that awesome again? And I start feeling like, 
man, we've been working towards that for a long time, and we're back at square one. You know, we, the next baptism Sunday, we're going to announce it today at the end of the service. It's August 18th, and we're back to square one. We need more people to be saved. We need more people to be baptized. And sometimes it starts feeling like it's overwhelming. But you know what the reality is? We don't have to top that. All we have to do is just long for more. All we have to do is just continue to be faithful. All we have to do is never stop. We just have to keep going and running and seeking and finding and asking God to do what only God can do. We just have to be faithful and we just have to keep dreaming big that there's more people to be saved and there's more lives to be transformed. So dream big and get involved in the work and God will continue to bless. Here's a question that I want you to ask yourself this morning. What am I longing for? If we're in a dream big, I mean, I've been reflecting on this all week. What am I longing for? What do you long for in the depths of your soul? I mean, do you long for financial prosperity? Do you long for peace from problems? Do you long for that next promote? Like, what is it that we're longing for? Are we longing with a holy ambition to be submitted and surrendered to God like like all of these kids were talking about this morning. That, that, That nevertheless, like, I'm not here for myself. I'm not here for the pleasures of this world. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to point other people to Jesus. I'm here as an ambassador for Christ. That's why I exist. That's why I'm here. And in the depths of our heart and in the depths of our soul, what is it that we long for? Can I tell you this morning when when Nathan got up here and when he was given that testimony about being surrendered to ministry, my heart was about to burst out of sight of me. You know what I I long for? I long for Nathan to get through his teenage years and to get into full-time ministry and for God to use him in incredible ways. You know what I long for in the depths of my soul? Every single one of those teenagers, every single one of your kids that went to camp and that heard the truth of God's word and made decisions, that, that Satan will stay away from them, that God will protect them, that they'll surrender their hearts and their lives and that they'll make it, that they'll survive, that they'll, they'll live for God and be everything that God created them to be. You know what I long for? I long that you'll, you, every single person here will become everything that God created you to be. Man, when I study God's word and when I go through these messages and when we're putting them together, I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking about God's church and I'm thinking about, man, God's word has the power to transform lives. God's word has the power to set us on the right path. What can God do in us and through us if we're all surrendered and submitted to him and if we're all striving to become everything that he's created us to be? Hey, you know what I long for? Oh, I've been longing for this for a long time. Probably ever since I fully surrendered to ministry, I've been longing to see God's power on full display. You know what? I, I, I got tired of just growing up and hearing about the God who did great things in the past, who did great things in the Bible. And almost we get this cynical approach to life. Like, yeah, God did miracles then and he's done miracles in the past, but man, things are complicated and I don't know if he can use me. And you know what that is? That's a bunch of baloney. I was gonna say hogwash, but I don't know where that was coming from. <laughs> That's just nonsense. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he's the same God as he was in the Bible, then that means he's the same God to us today. And that means he still wants to work, and he still wants to move, and he still wants to transform, and he still wants to change lives. And I don't want to live going through life just only tasting a little bit of God's power. I want to see it on full display. I want more baptism Sundays with more people that are being saved, more lives that are being transformed. And who's to say, why can't God do it? God can do it. It's just a matter of whether or not we're going to be dreaming and longing and living for those types of things. The question I ask for you is, what are you longing for? What do you long for in the depths of your soul? What are you longing to do with a holy ambition that only God can do in and through you? How are you pushing the boundaries of the gospel? How do you want God to use you? And if we can't answer that question, something's got to change. We got to begin. We got to get a holy ambition. We got to ask God to give it to us or else we're just going to continue to live frustrated, lackluster lives and miss out on the incredible things that God's doing and he wants to do. So we begin with holy ambition. 
Secondly, we continue with focused determination. If we're going to finish well, if we're going to never stop and finish well, we've got to continue with focused determination. All right, look at verse 25. He says this, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And I just have to stop and say, what? Didn't you just say that you were done in Jerusalem to Illyricum? And didn't you just say that you really wanted to go to Rome so that you could get to Spain? But then he comes very next thing and he says, but I've got to go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And I'm just like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it does. He's going to explain. Paul had some unfinished business. This is really where the whole message comes from. He had something he needed to finish before he could go on to the next thing that God was calling him to do. So look at verses 24, uh, actually verses 26 to 28. Look what it says. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain." So what we learned from these verses is that Paul had spent his whole last ministry tour in Macedonia and Achaia at every church that he had been to. He had been taking up an offering for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. And by the way, they were poor. There was a famine that was going through the land. They were ostracized because of their faith in Christ. They needed some relief and they needed some help. But this was far more than just a humanitarian offering. Paul saw an opportunity to do something huge with the gospel of Jesus Christ through all this. You have to understand Paul's ministry to the Gentiles created an unbelievable uproar in the church at Jerusalem. If you know anything about the Bible, you'll know that the Jews and the Gentiles, they weren't friends. They hated each other. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles, he's going out and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? He's not requiring them to be circumcised. He's not requiring them to obey the law. And the Jews back in Jerusalem are like, what is Paul doing? And so they summon him to appear before a council in Jerusalem. So Paul goes back and he stands before this council and he says, the gospel, Jesus Christ set us free from the law. The law was our schoolmaster. All it did was show us that we were sinners and that we needed a savior. And the law, we've been set free from that. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ by faith and you can be saved. And Paul defended his point and he was proven to be right. And so they realized that there's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. So you know what they did? They gave him his blessing and they sent him back on their way. But right before he left, Peter, James, and John said to Paul, they said, just do one thing, just this one thing. Remember the poor saints in Jerusalem. And Paul happily agreed. You know why? He saw an opportunity for unity in the gospel. And you know what he did? He went into Macedonia and to Achaia. He went to churches like the church at Corinth. And he said, hey, listen, the poor saints in Jerusalem need your help. You know what those Gentile Christians probably did? Gave you the biggest eye roll that you could ever possibly imagine. Like the Jewish people need our help. And Paul said, yes, they do. They're believers in Christ. And by the way, You owe all the spiritual blessings that you have in Jesus to them because the blessings started way back in the Old Testament with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and God promised that all the world would be blessed through them and he sent his son Jesus and listen, you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be forgiven, you wouldn't have the hope of heaven unless it was for how God used the nation of Israel. Listen, you are in debt to these believers in Jesus Christ because of all the blessings that you're experiencing, the fruit began in them and started with them. And so you owe them is essentially what he was saying. And by the way, the church is there. They gave, they gave happily. They gave in second Corinthians, it says uh, out of the abundance of their poverty, like they had nothing and they gave liberally above and beyond what they were able. And so he had collected this offering and there was no way that he was not going to let it be received well back in Jerusalem. So he's got to take this offering back in Jerusalem before he feels like he's free to be able to go to Rome and to go to Spain. Here's the practical application from all of this. Don't quit. Don't quit. Go ahead and put the first map up here. I I want to show you something. You see that little red dot in the center? That's Corinth. That's where Paul was. Okay, go ahead and put the next one up. All right. Where Paul wanted to go was way up there in the top left to Rome. Paul's really not that far. He's just a little boat right away. I mean, it's not that far nowadays. You could be there in a couple hours. Back then, it might have been a couple days, but he's not that far from Rome. But guess where Jerusalem was? All the way down at the bottom right. 
For Paul to go out of his way, to go to Jerusalem, even though he had big plans of where he wanted to go, was at least 1,000 miles out of his way. And make no mistake about it, that was going to be a long, arduous journey that was going to affect him in every single way possible. All right? Don't quit. Ministry is a lot like watering your plants. Okay, I brought an illustration. I want to show you some stuff. It's a lot like watering plants. I've been into watering my plants this summer because my grass actually looks really good for some reason. I don't know why. Normally it just dies, but this summer it's doing well. And we got some plants, and uh, some of the plants we buy every year are ferns. Anybody get ferns at the beginning of the year? I am sorry, Levi. Do not want to ruin the instruments up here. Okay. So to me, when I was thinking about this passage, I'm just thinking about every single day of my life right now in order to keep my plants alive and in order to keep them green, except when it's raining. Thank goodness for the rain we've had the past few days. Because this last week, I was about to quit, man. It's hot. We have heat wave advisories every single day. And every morning, I'm out watering my grass. I'm out watering my plants. It takes like over an hour to do it all. But man, I'm committed to keeping them alive. But I got to be honest with you, some days I just want to quit. I don't want to do it. But now that's so minor compared to what we're talking about with Paul. When we think about Paul, we hear the highlights. But you understand for him to get to Jerusalem would have taken weeks and months. And the end of Acts details the trip. And he went back through city after city and he ministered while he was there. And often he was even persecuted and he had like lots of late nights and sometimes traveling all the way through the night. I mean, it was insane for him to get back to Jerusalem. You understand that that ministry, you get that holy ambition from God that he lays on your heart and it is tiring and it is exhausting because you know how God's going to show up and do big things. He's going to show up and do big things if you are faithful in the little things day after day after day after day when you don't feel like it, when you want to quit. And that's what Paul was doing. Paul was living his life that way. And I think Paul was willing to do these things because Paul knew what God had called him to do, and he was going to do it until it was fully accomplished. And we have to do the same thing. Know what your holy ambition is. Know what God's called you to do, and get up every single day of your life and do it. And here's what happens, and I don't even think we realize this all the time. But this is the beauty of what ends up happening. And I hope you all over there can see it. Man, you just go out there, water every day. You don't even have a clue what's taking place, but... Check that guy out right there. I got to come down and admire that thing. I don't think I have it on the good side. Atlanta's already saying. And it got kind of beat up a little bit by the rain, and I've moved it around quite a bit. But this thing, and maybe that's even a better picture of the church. The church is big and beautiful, but it's got some things that you got to deal with from time to time, you know? Is that better or worse? It's big. That's all I want you to see, okay? (laughs) Don't worry that it's like... uh, not, it, man, it was really beautiful, but like I said, I've moved it around a lot. But anyway, do you get what I'm trying to tell you right here? Do you see the point when you don't quit? You don't realize. But this is exactly, do you know what that offering did for those saints in Jerusalem? The offering united the Jews and the Gentiles. It took the church from being split into factions, and it united them in a glorious way. And people are starting to look, and they're saying to some of their Gentile friends, you're friends with Jews? And to the Jewish people, you're friends with the Gentiles? Yes. And how is this possible? It's possible because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And all of a sudden, something big and something amazing starts to happen. And I want to tell you this morning, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. Here's a question I want you to ask yourself. What are you determined to finish? What are you determined to finish? Verse 29, Paul said this. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Paul knew that he had to go to Jerusalem to take the offering, but he was also sure that when he got there, he was going to come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. But here's what you have to realize. His future blessings depended on him finishing what God had called him to do and finishing what he started. And I know a lot of times it's easy to get our eye off the prize and it's easy to get dissatisfied with where we're at and it's easy to start getting tired and think, man, this is hard and we want to jump to something else and we want to jump into something new that might look a little bit more glamorous. But finish what God has called you to do. I don't know who needs to hear this today. Maybe your holy ambition is for a neighbor or a coworker that needs to be saved and maybe you're tired and maybe you're a little frustrated. Just keep watering 
Just keep watering. I promise you God's doing something behind the scenes that you can't see. Hey, maybe you're a little bit tired in ministry. Maybe you've been singing in the choir for a long time, or maybe you've been doing children's ministry for a long time, and maybe it just is like, I'm busy, and life's crazy, and and it's hard sometimes, and maybe you want to quit, but if that's what God's called you to do, and if that's where your holy ambition is, then stick with it. Don't quit. Don't give up. Hey, maybe it's in through your job. How's God using your job to use you to advance his gospel? Hey, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't be weary and well-doing. Get up every day. Keep watering. Keep doing the things that that you know you're supposed to do, and God, God will bless, and the gospel will look glorious. What are you determined to finish? Last but not least, rely on divine power. If we're going to finish well, we gotta, it, gotta, it has to begin with a holy ambition. What do you long for in the depths of your soul? Hey, if you want to finish well, you got to have a, a focused determination what do you need to finish today? What do you need to just get rejuvenated and, and throw yourself back into wholeheartedly? But you know, if we're going to finish well, if we're going to never stop, this is the key of all keys. You've got to rely on divine power. I'm actually going to start in verse 31 and then go back to verse 30, but look what it says. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Paul's got two main prayer requests that he's asking these people to pray for. He's First prayer request is for his safety. For Paul to go back into Jerusalem was for Paul to risk his life. He was a wanted man in Jerusalem. He was hated in Jerusalem, and it was very dangerous, and there was actually a whole lot of people that were begging him not to go back, but he said, this is what I believe God wants me to do, so it's what I'm doing. So he's headed back into Jerusalem. So pray for his safety. And then secondly, he says, pray that the offering will be accepted. Could you imagine if the saints in Jerusalem snubbed the offering? Could you imagine if they said, no, we don't want that because it's from the Gentiles? This was a concern that Paul had, a concern that was big enough for him to go a thousand miles out of his way to take the offering to them, to explain to them how the Gentile Christians and the churches gave generously and liberally. He wasn't taking any chances with the unity of the gospel and the unity of the church. So that's what he said. Pray that it's going to be accepted because, because if it is, Think about how glorious that's going to make the church. Think about what God's going to do through something like that. Now go back to verse 30. And this is his, this is his ask right here. Now I beseech you, I'm pleading with you, I'm, I'm begging you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. Hey, I'm begging you and pleading with you because you love God and because you love others which is what every child of God should do. That's the simplest way to put that. Because you love God, because you love other people. He says that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. I'm begging with you. I'm pleading with you that you strive with me. And you know another way that you could say that word strive? That you fight in battle with me. I'm about to go back to Jerusalem. It's dangerous for me there. There is spiritual opposition. They want my life. They want me dead. And make no mistake about it, Satan does not want the church to be united. And what is happening and taking place is greater and bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. This is spiritual warfare. And I want you to fight in battle with me because we're talking about eternity. That's what's at stake. Paul's saying, fight with me. And here's the practical application. We gotta fight with prayer. If we want to never stop, if we want to finish well, if we want to run our race with joy and be energized, we need God's help. And we've got to fight with prayer. And Paul is enlisting the help of others. He's saying, I need you to pray with me and for me for my safety. And I need you to pray with me and for me for the unity of the gospel. Do you understand that if people are going to be saved from an eternity in hell, if they're going to find hope in Jesus, I need you to get in the battle and you can fight with me on your knees in prayer. Can I tell you this morning, I think this is the biggest place that we're weak. What could God do in us and through us? What could he do in and through you? If we earnestly and desperately prayed, what could God do in and through us as a church if we earnestly and desperately prayed, if we realized that the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have the Holy Spirit of God and his power available to us if we will get on our knees and if we will fight in prayer. I was thinking this morning, 
You know, when our missionaries come through here and they ask us to pray for them, they're not just asking that. They're begging us and pleading with us. It's not just words. They're not just asking for our money. They need our prayers more than they need our money because they are doing huge things and they're going into areas that may not have heard the gospel and Satan doesn't want the gospel to go forward, does he? So when they ask us to pray, we need to pray. Hey, when Pastor Joel gets up here and he asks you to pray for these teenagers, how many of you agree that the world is throwing everything in their power at these kids to try to stop them and keep them from going on and living for God? I see every parent and grandparent nodding their heads. You know what weapon we have? Oh, we worry and we fret and we stay up at night and we cry and we talk about it. But how much talking to God do we do on our knees? Get on your knees. Go to God in prayer. You have the power of Almighty God available. And don't quit and keep pouring water on that fire every single day because God is working and he is moving and he is able even though we're not. How many of you believe that the unity of the church is important? Man, I I pray for our church that it, it has a testimony in this community that people, when they hear about West Florida Baptist Church, they know about Jesus and they know that they're welcomed and they know that they're accepted and they know about the transforming power of Jesus Christ and they know about the hope that they can find in Christ and they wanna be here and they wanna belong because we're not living for ourselves and we're not distracted by petty arguments. Our eyes are fixed on the prize. Do you believe that there's a lot at stake in our world today? I think everybody believes that. Man, we got elections coming up. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that is happening in this world. Crazy stuff. Pandemics. I mean, we just had like an IT strike. I mean, there's just big things that are happening and taking place. And I know that there's a lot of fear, but you know what the world needs? The world needs Jesus. And he doesn't need Christians who are going to retreat. And he doesn't need Christians who are going to be fearful. But he needs Christians who will realize that we can't do it and we don't have the answers, but God can. And we get on our knees and we fight in prayer. The question here is, what are you expecting God to do? What are you expecting God to do? Look how... He ends verse, this chapter in verses 32 and 33. He says that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. You know what Paul was expecting God to do? Answer his prayers. That's a novelty. Paul was expecting God to answer his prayers. And guess what? God did. The, Jew, the Jewish church in Jerusalem, they received that offering with gladness. And you know what? He was safe, but not in the way that he thought. (laughs) When he got to Jerusalem on like day number two, the first morning he woke up, he went to the temple and an angry mob met him there and they were about to kill him. But the Romans stepped in and they arrested him and brought him into custody and he was safe. For two years he was safe in Jerusalem. And guess what? He made it to Rome. And while he was in Rome, sure, he was in chains, but he was ministered to by the church at Rome and he was refreshed. And you know what he got to do? He got to give the gospel to Nero. How many of you agree that that probably exceeded his expectations and what he ever thought God could have done in his life? What are we expecting God to do? I think this passage just ministers to me and speaks to me in many ways because if we don't have holy ambition, we don't even know what it is that we're supposed to be finishing and we're not passionate about the things that we're serving and doing within our life, We're not going to be expecting God to do great things. Church, I expect Nathan Blevins to make it in ministry one day and to go on and do great things for God's honor and for God's glory. But we got to pray. Hey, I expect my kids to grow up and live for God and serve God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we got to pray. Hey, I expect... God's power to be on full display in this church, but make no mistake about it, we gotta fight in prayer. We gotta beg God. We gotta ask God to do that. Hey, I expect God to work in your life and in your family and for him to do great things in you and through you, things that exceed your wildest expectations. But you know what? I've gotta pray for you and I've gotta pray with you and you gotta be willing even to humble yourself and ask other people to pray. You know what I recognize? I need your prayers. I need you to pray for me. I don't have the wisdom that I need every day of my life. I don't have 
the abilities that I need to have every day are always the answers to help my kids to see the potential that God has for them to help what I have here to get in their heart. I, I cannot do that by myself. I can't do that in my own strength and in my own power. I have no idea how to go about having another baptism Sunday like we had last week, except for us just to pray and keep talking about Jesus and keep inviting people and keep living for something that's bigger than ourselves. And if we do that, God's going to work. And he's going to move and do things that can only be attributed to him. But we got to get off the sidelines and we got to get in the fight and we got to get on our knees. And we got to live like what we say we believe.